Welcome to the Art of Marketing Operations, a Taylor podcast. Here you can grow your knowledge about marketing operations, listen to ideas and strategies to help you scale, grow, and optimize your efficiency, drive your speed to market, and enrich your work life. Let's get to it. Welcome to the Art of Marketing Operations, a Taylor podcast. I'm Glenn Bottomley, and today my guest is Andrew Wagner, Chief Marketing Officer at Mighty Spark, a premium poultry company bringing snacking to families. Thanks for joining us today, Andrew. Thanks, Glenn. I appreciate you having me on. Well, one of the things that when we chatted before, one of the things that I know you are most passionate about is this perspective that marketers are general managers and that marketing should be much more connected across the entire enterprise. So as we kick off, walk us through this idea and how you arrived at that perspective. Definitely. So think about the marketer being the first person or the first team or function that touches your product, right? What product are you going to build? People think about marketers making the decision on which consumer is going to buy that product. Well, when you think about who that consumer is going to be, you will determine which product to build. And which product you build has to touch R&D, research and development. It has to touch operations who builds it. There needs to be a business model on how expensive the product is. So how expensive are you sourcing your ingredients? How do you put that into a product and then price it appropriately, which touches finance across the board? And by the way, sales has to sell your product, in our case, into a retailer. So when you're determining who you're targeting, and what product you're making, you inherently have to touch every other function to determine what you're going to bring to market. That's what marketing is. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Even if, yeah, no matter what. And so, but why then do you think that some, you know, some people think, you know, marketing is just advertising, you know? <laughs> so what, what, why, why is that the, the case? And why shouldn't marketing have that broader view? Definitely. Glenn, it's such a great question. And it's one that I get from my family and I've been in marketing for you know decades. Um, I think it's two reasons. First is there is this social perception, at least in the US, you know, it comes from TV shows like Mad Men. It comes from commercials. You know, when you watch a movie and there's a boardroom, it's not really that accurate. They're just sort of exaggerating. So I think there's some of that where when you see it on TV or in social media, it seems like a marketer is an advertiser. Um, the other reason that I think that happens is because in other industries outside of consumer packaged goods where, where we live is that sometimes marketing is synonymous with advertising. Sometimes marketing teams in other industries and, um, and other companies can just do that advertising or that digital media and, and that sliver that's not general management. So I think it's both. I think it's cultural and I think it's um, based on your industry. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's why I think this podcast is so interesting because, you know, we talk about marketing operations and to some organizations, marketing operations is very much, you know, uh, leads, marketing qualified leads, sales qualified leads, sales funnels, MarTech, et cetera. We've had other guests where marketing operations is the actual operational creation of creative materials for uh, a movie product or a DVD or something that goes into multinational uh, you know, markets, and it's the actual operations of creating. So it's such a broad umbrella. So let's bring it down to something very concrete. Can you then share a story uh, you know, with us that of an experience where this you know, it, this uh, focus of marketing being a general manager uh, became very real to you and that, you know, where you learned that marketing is so much more comprehensive than it might at first seem. Definitely. Uh, I remember literally my first day at General Mills. That's where I started my, my marketing career, basically. I was on the, the brand Old El Paso, which many Americans know, um, you know, bringing really flavorful uh, Mexican inspired food to the mainstream. And we were launching a new uh, cooking sauce. So we were trying to compete with Frontera, who was a restaurant who came into the consumer packaged goods space and, and was really successful. And we said, well, 
if we're the number one Mexican inspired food in the grocery store, why shouldn't we have a cooking sauce? I inherited this project. The problem was we could not figure out, you know, to my prior statement, what that business model would be. And what I mean by that is we had really, really premium ingredients we were using in this product. We were taking these poblano peppers and red peppers and green peppers and capsicum, and we were basically grinding them down to a sauce. And it was very authentic, a very good product that I still stand by today. But there's a, an issue with that. The issue with that is it's really, really expensive inputs. So what do you have to do? You have to price that to a point where maybe not the mainstream can afford or are willing to spend on it. And that's when I really realized that this is all connected. This is not just saying, hey, everybody, we have this great tasting premium sauce. It's tying it to you also have to put it at a price that that consumer is willing to pay for it. And to do that, I had to work with R&D. I had to work with operations. I had to work with finance. And first you try to figure out, well, I don't want to dumb down the product, right? I don't want to make it less premium ingredients. Are there operational efficiencies we can use? Are there ways to save on packaging or shipping? Or you have to be creative a little bit to take cost out without taking product quality out. And that's was, that was my first you know, consumer packaged goods or CPG experience that I really saw how closely tied those were. I was sitting at a, a conference room table. I had an, an R&D person, a food scientist. I had an operations person. I had a finance person and they're all looking at me to make that decision. I had no experience in marketing, but that was, I mean, talk about your first experience and that, whoa, I got hit with this tidal wave of this is what marketing does in consumer packaged goods and immediately fell in love with that function because that's what I signed up for. Oh, what a fantastic story and what a great way for you to uh, move into the marketing uh, discipline. That's fantastic. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about then on the, let's dig in on the financial side. Um, obviously one of the major financial concepts is return on investment, so ROI. So in your opinion, then how does ROI fit in a marketing operations or marketing function? And then why is it then so important to then always be bringing in that financial lens in any marketing function? Absolutely. Let me answer the second question first, which is why do you have to bring that financial lens? Because finance, financial lenses and, and financial acumen is the language of business. It is, that is why we're all here. Um, it is our scorecard. We are here because we're trying to make a profit. That's, that's why we, we play this game. Um, so if you don't have that lens, then you're not going to be successful in business. So you, you have to have that lens. And I think that's why it's so important for marketers to do so, that we have that, you know, quote unquote, credibility, even internally to say, I understand that we're doing this to give consumers a product that they want, but do so at a profit. Um, so to answer your first question, how do you bring ROI into that? This is the hardest part to me in marketing. In trading stocks, you can very easily say, if I buy a stock price at $10 and I sell it at $15, I have made $5 per share. That is math, it's a formula, and it works. In marketing, it is not that easy. There is art and there is science. And what I always like to do is I like to separate, there is always a short-term ROI and a long-term ROI in what you're trying to do. Both of those can be hard to prove in marketing. Now, short-term ROI might be very small. Let's use an example. Let's say we spend $100,000 on a digital campaign to go out on Instagram and TikTok and YouTube shorts, and we produce a spot and we put it out there. How many products did that sell? That's really hard to measure. There are tools to measure that. There are marketing mix models, but it's still hard to measure that short-term ROI. What I like to do is say, okay, that short-term ROI, here's how we did measure it. We measured it in impressions and how many people saw it. We measure that in reach, which is literally how many people saw it. Now we can apply a percentage of what we believe people that saw it ended up going to buy. And then we can do that math formula in the short term. I think the more important thing for marketers is to say, what's the long-term ROI of this? There are leading indicators, meaning if we go get 
10,000 people on that $100,000 investment, those 10,000 people will buy our product six times per year, but it's not just in this year. They're going to buy it next year and the year after and the year after. And by the way, if they love it that much, they're probably going to tell their friends about it. And that long-term ROI of doing that spot in year one is not just the year one short-term ROI. It's that benefit of the net present value of all of your future cash flows. And if a marketer can use that language and show that math, then it just becomes an easier conversation with leadership, with finance, with a board, with whomever your internal stakeholders are. That was where I was going to go next is, you know, how do you then communicate that to senior and executive management? It's one thing to your, to your point, uh, you know, show your math. Uh, but there's, there's other stories to tell, you know, a, along the lines of financial metrics, ROI, of course, being a critical one. Um, any other advice in terms of how you communicate the value that a business, a product, an initiative uh, is, is having and is bringing to the organization when communicating to executive leadership? Absolutely. I think there's two, there's two ways to do that. The first is having a model built. Now, that can scare a lot of marketers, and you might need to get help on that. But literally having that long-term, call it an Excel model, that shows your consumer lifetime value and how you're gaining those households over time, um, showing that and, and having that model can help with that communication. But also, it shouldn't be a big reveal. I wouldn't go into a board meeting or a meeting with our CEO or CFO and say, hey, look what I built. I would do it with them. I would bring them along in the process. Hey, here's how I'm building this. Here's how many consumers I think that we can grab throughout the lifetime of this campaign or activity or whatever it is you're doing. And if you bring them along in the process of building and thinking about that model, they're bought in from day one. So yes, I do think that modeling helps, but also I think that bringing those key stakeholders along through the process is invaluable. Mm. That involvement, that collaboration, uh, to your point, uh, not only is that just good business practice, but to your point, helps to sort of uh, grease the skids of, of decision making and so forth. But that it brings something to my mind where when we chatted before related to decision making, because you have a very, very specific point of view around decision making, which I, I wanted to kind of take a minute to, to dig into. And that is that, you know, we know as marketers that we can't always guarantee you know, anything, um, particularly when making a decision. But one of the techniques that I think is really uh, key in how you do this is you're always showing the pros and the cons when making a decision or to an upcoming decision. So in your opinion, why is it so important to then show, hey, if we as an organization make this decision today, there are pros to this decision and there are cons to this decision as well. Why is it so important in your experience to, to make sure to have that balanced view to any decision? Yeah, um, well, I think that answer is also twofold. One is you have to play devil's advocate with your own decision if you're, if you're going to make the right decisions, right? Like you don't just jump down a double black diamond skiing if you've never <laughs> skied before. You're, you're thinking about what could go wrong here. You need to have that devil's advocate to, to play, um, you know, is this the right decision? So just even before you communicate internally that you've shown your pros and cons, you need to do that with yourself. But communicating that internally is the second part of it. And, and when I say internally, I mean, you know, within your own company, when you're making these decisions, it's you've shown that you've thought about it. And that's, that's the first thing that you will immediately not only gain credibility, but you'll gain that. Uh, that alignment that you have thought about this from a lot of different angles, but also when you're making a decision as a marketer and why I love being a marketer is you are the general manager that is the key decision maker, but it is still a team and company decision. Every decision I make isn't just my decision. I have a CFO, a CEO, a head of operations, a head of sales, all of those people, we're all in this together. We're not separate teammates on a sports team trying to go for individual statistics. So I need to tell my teammates, this is why I think we should do this. This could go wrong. Let's all be in this together. And I think that's the key of showing the pros and cons because everybody needs to be educated on both the benefit, 
but the potential cost. Yeah. And I would imagine that you probably, uh, in support of this position, uh, is the fact that when you have incomplete information, that constantly is going to complicate uh, any decision that you make, because we're always faced with incomplete information. Some decisions you have more information, therefore you can feel like you can make a more effective decision. Other times you have, you know, less information, but you still have to make this, this decision. So I think your tactic of having the pro and con in always presenting that, it, it helps to almost negate or at least accept the fact that, hey, we know that we're, we don't have perfect information here. Um, would you agree or would you disagree? Absolutely. And part of that is what is the balance of how much data you need, how much information you need? And sometimes that information just does not exist. If you are launching a new product, we sell chicken. Let's say we decided that we wanted to launch a buffalo chicken stick, uh, snack stick. There is information out there. There are other buffalo chicken snack sticks. We can look at that data, but that doesn't prove whether or not it's going to be successful. There's still a leap of faith on here is the information we have and here is the information we don't have. In marketing, very rarely will you have all of the information. You know, this isn't you're going to three different car dealerships. They all have the exact same car and that one's the cheapest. That's not what we face on a day to day basis. What we face is ambiguity. So by, again, speaking internally, talking about pros and cons, but also saying to your point, Glenn, here is information we do not have. And by the way, we're never going to. I think having that, um, it's almost being humble in a way. You never want to sell and, and act like you have all of the information when you don't. I think, again, it brings everybody together on we are making this decision with the most information we have, but we're never going to have all of it. So I think saying, I don't know, or this is part of what I don't know, can also actually make you more credible, ironically. Yeah, right. More credible uh, and a more effective communication communicator uh, you, you know, within an organization. And, and, and one of the things that I think is unique about your business uh, in many businesses is because, as you stated right at the very beginning of, of this episode, is you are selling through channel partners, a retail location, you know, other buyers, et cetera. So that is an interesting complication because it's, you know, you're not selling directly to a consumer, although you market, of course, to, to consumers and support the, con the, the marketing to consumers. But how do you then, or what advice could you have about making good decisions that not just fit well with the ultimate consumer, the buyer, but also the channel partner or like a retail buyer, a retail location, et cetera. And why is then marketing to that channel partner equally as important as the direct marketing to the buyer? That's such a great question. And that is the, the crux of consumer package goods. So for any listeners that aren't familiar, you know, when you go to a Target, a Kroger, a Walmart and buy a product, that means that me as Mighty Spark, if you buy a Mighty Spark chicken snack stick, you are not actually buying it directly from us. You're buying it from Walmart or Target or Kroger or any one of those retailers. We have to sell into them. So what Glenn's asking is, how do you think about that person or that gatekeeper? They are your gatekeeper. They are our first line to the consumer that we're ultimately trying to get to. So what we have to do is we have to show them the benefit of why we should be on their shelf. So if they have a shelf of 10 products, why should we be one of those 10? Why, if you replace somebody with us, will your category, your shelf, make more money or sell to more consumers or bring more consumers to your aisle than anybody else? That's really the key in CPG marketing is you have to have that buyer lens. Now, what helps is by showing your benefit to the end consumer, it should trickle back all the way through the process to that retailer, but you do need to have that retailer lens and, and they're usually called buyers. Well, those buyers, again, they're thinking about what is most incremental to my shelf. You need to illustrate and prove why that's you. In our case right now, as an example, I'm sitting in this, this meat snacking aisle, the jerky aisle, and there's not a lot of chicken. Why is that? If chicken is the number one protein consumed in the US. Why is the jerky set mostly beef or beef and pork? That doesn't make sense. 
you should bring the number one protein into your set. And when we have those conversations with buyers, a light bulb goes off. And that's, that's sort of the communication you need to have. So it's not just about the end consumer. It's exactly what you said. That gatekeeper who owns the shelf, that retailer, is who we need to sell to first. Mm -hmm. well, and I would imagine a key part of that is, you know, uh, not only great marketing, the communication, as you just described it, as you pitch that to your channel, but the way in which your packaging looks, so physical marketing impressions, uh, it's asked, it has to be huge in the C CPG space. Um, and so what's the difference in your experience uh, when you have really solid physical marketing packaging? Uh, marketing materials, et cetera, um, particularly in light with the strength and importance of digital marketing impressions as well. Can you talk about those two, both the physical marketing and the digital marketing? Absolutely. The, the digital marketing piece, I, I like to think about that as just outside of store, right? How are you telling consumers who you are before you're even in the store? You know, we are not Coca-Cola. We are not Oreo. People don't know who we are when they walk into the store in many cases. Now, in some cases, we have a very loyal consumer that definitely knows who we are, but we need to tell consumers about that. And by the way, to the last question, buyers and retailers care about how much you're investing in telling people outside of the store to bring them into your store. So that is very, very important. But when you're thinking about ROI, you have to tell millions of people and then you will get tens or hundreds of thousands of people that actually go into a store because of that. So it's a low percentage. When you're at the shelf, that is your number one asset. So even if I didn't bring anybody into the store, even if we had no digital marketing at all, if I have the best package that stands out on shelf, consumers are going to see that, read it. They are right there at the key point, which is the purchase decision, which is the only thing that matters. So the physical package, even though I think that digital and social and the advertising portion of marketing is very important, your package is the number one most important thing. How do you stand out and how do you communicate your benefits and why somebody should buy you more than your competitor in less than five seconds? Talk about a creative challenge. Talk about now when you're, when you're thinking about the creative side of marketing, why that's such a challenging task to go to an internal creative person or a creative agency doing package design and saying, I need them to understand that we are chicken and not beef and why the benefits of that are there, that it actually does taste better. Oh, and by the way, it's a healthy lean protein. And because it's chicken, we added these amazing flavors to it that you actually couldn't do with beef. How do you say that on a package when somebody's walking at three miles an hour without thinking about your brand? That's an awesome challenge. Why marketing is so fun. So what, what are some of the most effective strategies you've uh, arrived at when you think about m maximizing your physical marketing? Uh, and then also any tips or experiences that you've had in terms of how do you really make your digital marketing effective? Absolutely. Uh, with the physical one, I actually think that's a little bit easier to tell you the truth. What you have to do, and it's so hard, is you have to figure out what are those one, maybe two things that if a consumer sees you, they know right away? There are a million things you want to communicate to consumers. You want to communicate that you're no hormones added, that you're low calorie, that you taste great, that it's this flavor, that it's made of chicken, that you, um, that you give back and for every product sold, we actually donate. All of those things need to be communicated. But if you say six things to a consumer walking by, they're going to hear none of them. So it's my advice and my strategy on packaging is take your number one benefit and absolutely scream it. Then they'll find out your other ones, because if you have everything on there, it's going to get lost in the fray. Um, what we always used to say at, at General Mills, which I've taken through my whole career, is don't NASCAR your package. And that's not knocking NASCAR. What it is, is if you look at an actual stock car in NASCAR, they have stickers all over it, right? <laughs> And yeah. that's not what you want to do. Those little stickers, I'm sure some people see them, but for the most part, they're going to see one thing. What's on the hood? Is it the M&M's car? Is it the QVC car? Which that's the one thing you have to scream on your package in CPG. So from a physical marketing standpoint, take your number one or, no, or two benefit and scream it from the rooftops. For digital, it is way harder. You have a million brands in a million categories 
we aren't just fighting with, for the attention of a consumer in food anymore. They're not in a grocery store. They're on their phone and you're competing with funny golf videos or videos of pranks or cats that are really cute. You have to somehow break through. And in today's world, that's really, really hard. When you're on Instagram, who do you follow? Do you follow food brands? A lot of people don't. So how do you get compelling content that both sells your product, which you ultimately need to do, but you don't just want to sell your product. You have to entertain. And that's so much harder than just creating a package design. So what you need to do is you need to go to those influence that influencers that can be entertaining and show the product in a real world situation and solve a problem for the consumer and illustrate that on digital. That's way harder. Yeah. But to and, answer your and, question directly, it's solving the problem for the consumer on digital. Yeah, and I, I liked your analogy or your comment about, and you're competing against cats. Right. Because <laughs> exactly. you have to entertain. That, that's it's a it's a it's a great great point. So uh, Andrew, before we wrap up today's episode, what is the main takeaway that you want to share to help understand the challenges facing marketing operations executives today? Yeah, I think, you know, the two themes have come out here in, in your questions, Glenn, which were great. And those themes are marketing is the entire business. You have to think about everything that goes into a product, how you make it, what you price it at, how you get it to a store, what the packaging looks like, all of that. Marketing is taking every single function that goes into a product and bringing it all together. The second thing is you have to have that differentiating benefit that you communicate so obviously both on package and outside of store that consumers will want you. So if you're a 25 year old coming out of an MBA program and you're thinking about going into CPG marketing, what do you need to know? I should understand every function and take my finance classes, even if I'm a marketing major. And I need to figure out what that number one differentiating benefit really, really is for this product that I'm trying to sell. Excellent conversation. Well, that wraps up this episode of the Art of Marketing Operations. Thank you so much for joining us today, Andrew. Well, until next time, stay safe, take care. Thank you for listening to the Art of Marketing Operations brought to you by Taylor. Don't forget to hit subscribe in your favorite podcast player. If you enjoyed this episode, please rate, review and share. Until next time.